won't be able to step out here because I covered it. Yeah, the that's okay. I can see you. Stay. Three, two, one. Good afternoon and welcome to the Preservation Association of Lincoln Brown Bag Lecture Series. My name is Eileen Burke, and I'm the coordinator of these brown bags for the Preservation Association of Lincoln. Our videotaping today is sponsored by the Preservation Association of Lincoln. Our speaker today is Evelyn Haller. Evelyn was born in Chicago and has a PhD from Emory in Atlanta. She taught in California and at Creighton before her current teaching position at Doan College in Crete, where she is a professor of English and chair of the Fine Arts and Humanities Division. She has published on Willa Cather, Ezra Pound, which is no relation to Louise Pound, which she's also publishes with, published under, and uh, Virginia Woolf. Um, her talk today, Evelyn's talk today is titled, Louise Pound, Nebraska Scholar and Athlete. Please join me in welcoming Evelyn Haller. Well, good afternoon once again, and I want to begin by reminding everyone of Louise Pound's dates, 1872 to 1958, and she was both born and died in Lincoln. I will be making use of a very fine book by Robert Cochran, published by the University of Nebraska Press in 2009. And uh, Robert Cochran chose a longer title than the title I gave Eileen. Robert Cochran has Louise Pound, scholar, athlete, feminist pioneer. And uh, that is a justifiable title. It's a most interesting book. He goes into the history of Lincoln and Nebraska, as well as the remarkable career of Louise Pound. I had already published some short pieces on Louise Pound that Robert Cochran, I'm pleased to say, made use of. And I will be often actually referring to the historical information I've received from reading his excellent book. I want to start with this slide. Now, we are using antiquated technology. It slides in a carousel slide projector. But these are all very useful images. And I'm pleased to say that Cochran also made use of, of some of them in his book. Uh, the one on the postcard is one that uh, I took from his book, as a matter of fact, with Louise in a fashionable hat of the day. This display from the Nebraska State Historical Society Museum is a very good thumbnail sketch of her and her career. You see an image of her in her middle years, her still abundant red hair, and you see around her neck the doctoral hood, which is also on the side of this display. On the right is the mortarboard. And I will tell you in a few minutes the significance of that doctoral hood. But I want to draw your attention to the trophies at the bottom of the display case. Louise Pound was a remarkable athlete. I think a contemporary assessment would be that she was a natural born athlete because she seemed to excel in any kind of athletic activity she took up. You'll see between those traditional trophies a tea set. Sometimes when she was in competition, the people who had arranged the tournament would assume that a man would win, so they had only male kinds of trophies. On one occasion, there was a humidor that was to be assigned to the winner, presumably male. And as the matches went on, it became obvious that they had to come up with something else. So someone was dispatched to hurry out and get something suitable for a woman. In that case, it was a silver picture frame. 
which isn't here, unfortunately. So to return to that PhD, Louise Pound was not only physically gifted, well-coordinated, she was also extraordinarily impatient. So when she realized that getting a doctorate in the United States would take years, she decided to go to Heidelberg because she could get a PhD faster. And not only did she beat the usual length of time required at Heidelberg, she did so in a way that's likely to surprise you. It ordinarily took seven semesters at Heidelberg. She did it in two. Now, if you're familiar with graduate programs, <laughs> you're going to wonder how in the world. So I'll back up just a little. She had really wanted to go to Berlin instead of Heidelberg, but Berlin did not admit women at that time. So she went to Heidelberg. Now, how do you do it in two semesters? For one thing, you very cleverly choose a dissertation topic that can be managed. And the way she did that relates to the display of trophies. Her major sport was tennis. So she played a lot of tennis while she was in Heidelberg. And among the friends she played tennis with, she persuaded two of them to take her subject into a previous and then into a later century. The subject was adjectives in a medieval century of the English language. And Louise's century was just that, one century. And if we are lucky, but we're not, I was going to give you the full title, but it resides in Love Library to this day, published in 1901. So that was one of many ways that she was able to make use of her two very successful frames within her lifetime work. OK. Now, she spent more than 50 years teaching and being a student, sometimes overlapping, at the University of Nebraska. And during those years, she had notable friends. The University of Nebraska had many, many notable people, although in those days, the University of Nebraska was smaller than my college, Doan College in Crete, with over a 1,000 students, is now. So here she is with Willa Cather. Whoops. And here is Hartley Burr Alexander, a very important person in the intellectual history of our state. Hartley Burr Alexander was a student at the same time. He went on to become a professor of philosophy at the University of Nebraska, and he also had a kind of parallel career in iconography and inscription choices for significant buildings, the most significant of which is, of course, our state capital. So it's to Hartley Burr Alexander that we owe that marvelously coherent and complicated set of inscriptions and images. Hartley Burr Alexander also contributed two volumes to a general myth mythological compilation, one on the mythology of North American Indians, the other on the mythology of South American Indians. And this work was so impressive that he was invited to lecture at the University of Paris. There are other buildings around the country, the state capitol in Harrisburg, parts of Rockefeller Center in New York that also benefited from Hartley Burr Alexander's wonderful mind and resourcefulness. And this is a company of 
soldiers to be during the days of John Pershing's instructorship at the University of Nebraska. He taught mathematics as well as military science. And uh, one tidbit that's fascinating, Louise Pound was involved in a women's marching corps. They, they didn't collectively do very well, but while that was going on, Louise managed to become an expert rifle shooter. This is Louise Pound's mother, Laura Biddlecombe Pound. And I want to, after I give you this overview related to the slides, I want to return to Mrs. Pound because she wrote an account of her nine-day journey with her husband, Stephen, later to be, soon, in fact, to be Judge Pound, their nine-day journey to Lincoln in perilous times without a significant bridge to get across the Platte. And this is Judge Pound, Louise's father, who was an eminent person in the Lincoln and the Nebraska scene. This is Louise in her rational outfit with her Rambler bicycle. Rational outfit, it doesn't look that rational to us now, but if you think about corseting and the difficulties that would present in riding a bicycle, this does make sense, and she had the sense to dress in this way. For bicycling, she achieved a string of what were called century bars, which meant that one had bicycled at least 100 miles during a 12-hour period. Now, if you look at the terrain that the Rambler bicycle is standing on, and think about the condition of roads, even in a town such as Lincoln was, it's a remarkable achievement. And of course, those bicycles did not have gears, and they must have required, I would guess, considerable physical strength to, to ride. Now you'll see a series of Louise, the tennis player. She was state tennis champion, 1891 to 92, she would have been, Cochran says, the nation's top-ranked woman tennis player had such listings been compiled at the time. Keep in mind, my women students never think about this, the importance of Title IX in 1972, which made a great difference. But Louise had died in 1958, and her athletic accomplishments were done within a framework of really nothing in place to encourage women athletes. All they had going for them was their own set of skills and determination. And look at that racket. Louise was five feet five. The racket looks very big in proportion to her, and those rackets were heavy. They're not like contemporary tennis rackets. Here she is again, looking sunburned and determined, and uh, that tiny waist. Was she corseted? Probably not, but it looks as if she could have been. There, she, there are lots of pictures of her with her trusty tennis racket. This, I think, is very significant because I see in it <coughs> some elements of self-promotion. She had a man's letter in tennis from the university. She was the only woman on the team. And notice that whereas nearly all of them are in tennis whites, appropriate to the time, she's wearing a jacket that is going to photograph dark. It's a fashionable jacket with the leg of mutton sleeves. But she is definitely part of this cohort. But for whatever reason, I think strategically she is photographed on the side where she is more conspicuous. And here she is competing at the University of Chicago. 
There's a curious story about this event. Um, a woman named Atkinson was expected to win the tournament. And when Louise Pound won, this came as a surprise. She was described in news reports of the time as the Nebraska, cyc Nebraska Cyclone. And that night after the tournament, there was a party on the North Shore to which the women competitors were invited. And then th this strikes me as, as very, very curious, and it suggests that the organizers had never done athletic things themselves because you could assume that these women were very tired. There was a foot race, which Louise won, partly because she hadn't changed out of her shoes. And the woman who might have beaten her was wearing high heels. So you see all these little things that contributed to Louise's success and her ability to assess what she needed to succeed. This is Louise Pound about the time of her master's degree. Notice that her hair is curled. She might have used a curling iron to achieve that effect. And leaping ahead a bit, this is the women's basketball team that she coached. Now, this gets us into some um, curious commentary. And I will uh, go ahead and tell you about this. Louise Pound was recognized, of course, as being a very successful athlete on the University of Nebraska campus. And she pretty much, despite her job in the English department, felt that she was overseeing, looking after women's athletic activities at the university. But that was to change. And Louise Pound was not at all happy about it because the university hired Mabel Lee. And the year that she was hired was 1924. Mabel Lee came highly recommended, had remarkable credentials at a time when professional training for work in physical education was not common. Mabel Lee's charge was to revive the university's women's physical education program. Mabel Lee came in. She had had lots of experience as well as very good credentials from graduate programs as a full professor. This is a big deal. She thought that what needed to be done was to have a women's physical education program that had wholly intramural games. No games with other institutions. She thought that games with other institutions put undue emphasis on winning. And to her way of thinking, that isn't what women's physical education should be about. Rather, it should be on moderate physical activity. Now, I gather because I've looked through Mabel Lee's memoirs in the University of Nebraska Library, two volumes, and there's a third that hasn't been published, that she was, in effect, setting the women students up to continue moderate physical activity throughout their lives instead of being, with luck and against the odds, champions for a brief period. Now, Mabel Lee outlived Louise Pound by many years. She died at the age of 99 in 1985. Mabel Lee's first volume, published in 1977, was Memoirs of a Bloomer Girl. The second volume was Memories Beyond Bloomers, published in 1978. And at any rate, we have only Mabel Lee's side of the story in print, but Mabel Lee, in her memoirs, 
does complain about, quote, a faculty sportswoman <laughs> whose goals were very different from her own. And indeed, what Mabel Lee writes about is the faculty sportswoman's efforts to get her fired. Now, obviously, Louise Pound for once did not win at something that she undertook. So we have Mabel Lee continuing happily and doing things that most of us would think were very sensible for the time and the place, and perhaps even now. That's open to debate, and as a non-athlete, I won't get into that. Mabel Lee was inducted into the Iowa Women's Sports Hall of Fame in 1979, and Louise Pound was inducted into the Nebraska Sports Hall of Fame. No gender diver differentiation in the 1950s, which uh, she was pleased about, but probably thought should have happened a lot earlier. So here's the women's basketball team. Louise Pound insisted that women needed to play by men's rules, that women's rules for basketball were demeaning. And uh, the fun, the fun was in playing to win. So here she is, somewhat later, notice the coils of that wonderful red hair, and I think looking quite determined. And this is the picture that you saw on the first slide. And this is what Louise Pound took up after her days of tennis. What happened to her tennis game, she said, was that bifocals ruined her ground strokes. So she was state golf champion starting in 1916. She acquired a Ford, which she named Henry. And accounts have it that she was not a driver that you were able to relax in the car with. That she was, I can just imagine her getting impatient, having to wait behind somebody who was moving slowly. And this is from her later years. This is the house at 1632 L Street that the family moved into in 1892. And this was where Louise was able to spend much of her life. Her sister Olivia was not able to spend all her life there because the house evidently um, was sold. It no longer exists, which is a very sad commentary on the lack of preservation. So here you see it when the trees are bare, and notice the fish scale shingles on the sides and the covered carriageway, the porte cochere. Louise had a study on the top floor. Notice also the porch on the second floor, covered. When I wrote a short biography of Louise Pound for notable American women, a series of hefty volume that was published by the Belknap Press, which is part of Harvard. Among the questions to be answered was, how did your notable American woman deal with housekeeping? And something very, very wise went on in this house. Olivia and Louise had women students from the university who lived there, got their room and board, and in exchange did the housework, probably did even a lot of the cooking because Louise entertained a lot. So that was a very good way to deal with those practicalities. And as you look at this house, you can imagine that it was not an easy house to maintain. 
And there's another view with the trees in leaf. 1632 L Street. This is her sister Olivia. Olivia had a master's degree in classics, and according to Robert Cochran, um, of the three, that is Roscoe, the oldest child, Louise the second, and Olivia the youngest, she was the star classicist. Indeed, she has a publication about the meter of Greek poetry used in Swinburne's poetic works. Olivia spent many, many years as an administrator at Lincoln High, not as the chief administrator, but as vice principal and sometimes dean of girls. And she held the vice principalship for about 25 years. She also taught. And she also contributed to Louise's journal, American Speech. In its infancy, Louise, as editor, asked friends and obviously relatives to contribute to this young publication. Now what follows is a series of slides that I'll go through quickly that Olivia Pound used in her teaching, and I think they relate to, to what we're talking about today, because there's the Parthenon. And there is a, a cutting of what it probably looked like. And notice, you have to look a bit hard, the statue of Pallas Athene. So if ever there was a mythological model for strong, ambitious women, it is Minerva or, in the Greek, Pallas Athene. Here is Roscoe in the the rather unfortunate hairstyle of his time. <laughs> Roscoe had the first doctorate awarded at the University of Nebraska. It was in botany. And uh, Charles Edwin Bessie was his mentor, a man whose name looms large in that field of science. Bessie did some very sensible, practical things. One was that he instructed his students that it is not sufficient to look at a field and give a wild guess about the percentage of various plants. Rather, you take four stakes and twine and mark off a square meter and literally count. And more often than not, his students were surprised at what they counted as opposed to what they thought they saw. And that was but one example of his extraordinary work. Roscoe went on, acquired a law degree, and eventually became dean of Harvard Law. And people have asked me, and it's easy enough to find out, and I must, I fear that, well, being prejudiced toward Louise, Pound Middle School is named after Roscoe. <laughs> so here he is at this great half-circle desk looking very much a law school dean. And I should point out that when Roscoe married, he and his wife moved into 1632 L Street with the other members of the Pound family. And um, as I was looking at the slides just before coming this morning, I thought to myself, I've got to establish whether this is Charles Edwin Bessie or Judge Pound. I think it's Bessie. I won't stake my scholarly reputation on that. But the reason I kept it, even though I'd have to make this disclaimer, is that he has, bless his heart, a messy desk. <laughs> <laughs> and professors tend to fall into two camps, those with messy desks and those who are absolute fiends about order. Louise Pound maintained her interest in tennis even beyond her years as a competitor. So among her papers is a postcard of significant women tennis players of a later decade. And there they are in 
what comes close to rational dress for the time, not what um, Serena and Venus are wearing on the tennis courts, <laughs> but certainly possible to run around. And the headbands, even though they were also fashionable, make sense given that most competitors do sweat in championship tennis. So that's the end of the slides, and I do want to go back and mention a number of other things. Uh, one that's particularly important is how the three children were educated. Their mother, Laura Biddlecombe Pound, insisted that the public education offered in Lincoln at the time was, quote, too stereotyped. So she had a very large blackboard installed on one wall of the house inside. And she proceeded to use methods that Cochrane compares to Maria Montessori's. And I think he makes a good case. The idea was to teach students along the lines of inquiry. Now, Laura herself had had a good education at Lombard College in Galesburg, Illinois, which was a universalist college and denomination. It was unusual at the time because it admitted women and African Americans. Sad to say, Lombard College closed in 1930, but Laura Biddlecombe attended. She developed strong interests. Her program there was in ancient and modern languages. She taught school for a number of years. She, like her husband Stephen, were both from New York State. When Laura Biddlecombe Pound was living in Lincoln in the fifth year of the university, <clears throat> she enrolled in classes, quote, to perfect her German. Now, this gave, in the years to come, Louise the possibility of studying at the University of Heidelberg. Now, Louise was not entirely confident in her spoken German, but obviously she managed and she was able to read it and do what she needed to get that doctorate in two instead of the usual seven semesters. Louise, excuse me, Laura Pound in a 1922 interview about how she educated the children at home, stated that in the pursuit of inquiry, children should be encouraged to have what she called fads. And in the case of Roscoe, it was insects. Not too far from botany, really. And she cited the instance of when he brought a cocoon home and this was fine, and in time, a beautiful moth emerged. Louise went in for stamp collecting. And it's interesting that in both of these areas, collecting, classifying, naming were important aspects. And that's the way a lot of science was conducted at that time. Now, Louise's work, detractors are inclined to say, are by and large limited to classification and nomenclature. That there is a pitiful lack of aesthetic response. Well, Cochrane manages to find a passage in an introduction that Louise Pound wrote to Walt Whitman's writings when, indeed, she does wax eloquent about how Whitman's poetry is not burdened with fears of the loss of heaven and the pains of hell, but rather ecstasy over the divine world. Those aren't her exact words, but that's the general idea. 
It would be, well, I should mention rather quickly, it looks like, several interesting things about her scholarship. There was a curious idea in established circles of scholars who worked on medieval ballads that they had been co composed by the folk, not only by the folk, the peasantry, but by the folk as they held hands and performed circle dances. Somehow they managed to compose ballads. And Louise Powell knew that this was utter nonsense. First of all, she disputed the idea of the possibility in the first place, but then she went on to point out that the ballads are awfully good. And her assumption was that people who were poets, composers, musicians, composed the ballads. We don't have melodies to, to them, but they are very musical. So she engaged, well, she locked horns with a man named Gerald at Princeton. And he had some rather nasty things to say about her. But she clearly won that one, and Gerald is at best a footnote now. Uh, a more somber aspect of her professional life was that, try as she might, she could not get her women students with their graduate degrees who stayed on at the university promoted. And uh, the late Robert Knoll insightfully pointed out, because he and his wife Virginia had known Louise Pound very well, Robert Knoll pointed out that one way people who did not like Louise Pound could get her was through her women students. Uh, the particularly sad case is that of Mamie Meredith, who in 1951 published in a reputable journal a 40-page article, the Southern Folklore Quarterly, on the nomenclature of fencing. No work had been done on that before. But if you think back, if you try to imagine what things were like in 1951, folklore was not exactly respected in academic circles. And here was a woman writing about the naming of fences. But this was original work, and it was good work, and it should have gotten her at least a promotion to the next level. So those kinds of things happened. And it was Mamie Meredith and Ruth O'Dell, another student of Louise Pound's, who did the important work of gathering her papers in the year following her death. So I'm eager for questions, but I'll mention one more thing. As Louise Pound was in the hospital in 1958, she, of course, was impatient about being in the hospital. And her physician, Dr. Grace Loveland, broke the news to her that things did not look good. And Louise Pound, according to Dr. Loveland, picked up a book from the bedside table and hurled it against the wall. So to me, <laughs> that encapsulates a great deal about her. And there's so much more to tell, but I want to end here and invite your questions. <laughs> I think just this is about Louise, but um, Pound Middle School, if Olivia was an administrator with an LPS, would Pound be named after Olivia? Oh, I hope you're right. I mean, that because that seems how LPS names things after teachers and administrators, so perhaps <coughs> it was neither, indeed. And I can phone this very day and just ask whoever answers the phone. <laughs> Yes, I hope th I hope that's right. I hope that's right. Yes. What led you to your inquiry about Louise Pound? Was it through Willa Cather, or was it just in her own right? Well, I was very fortunate in that um, Anne Diffendall, who used to work for the State Historical Society, 
had received um, a letter from the women who were going to edit Notable American Women asking for nomination of subjects. And uh, if you had a subject, suggestions about the person who might write it. Uh, Anne Diffendahl's husband, Bob, was then teaching geology at Doan. So I, I, we were acquainted, and she told me about this and uh, said, you know, I think she's pretty interesting. <laughs> and this was true. So that's how it, that's how it happened. So in regards to Mabel Lee, whoever lives longest gets to tell the history, is that it? Yes, Cochrane keeps saying we have only one side, but you know, if you read those passages, um, Cochrane doesn't spill the one that I find particularly irritating, but Mabel Lee uh, suggests that her sports person rival spread a rumor, which wasn't true, that Mabel Lee was Roman Catholic. And remember, there were Ku Klux Klan marches in Lincoln, so this was a way to get to someone. The one he does mention, which Mabel Lee mentions, is that there was another rumor that she attributes to unnamed, she does not name Louise Pond, that um, Mabel Lee had an inappropriate relationship with a woman student, and in those days, as you can imagine, that was a very uh, dangerous kind of um, allegation. But Cochrane um, dismisses that absolutely and also frames it with, it's, it's very sad that this was a way to, to undermine, if not try to get somebody fired at the time. There are Two buildings on the university campus, tall dormitories, Pound and Lee. So, anyway, yes. Um, what, how old was she when she died? And did she teach to the end of her life? She didn't teach to the end of her life. Um, she was born in 1872 and died in 1958, 86-ish. In fact, um, Cochrane unearthed something, well, sad, that at a certain point before she retired, uh, there was, I don't know how to categorize it exactly, but she was no longer to direct master's and doctoral dissertations, master's theses and doctoral dissertations. And again, this seems kind of uh, mengy. She did not hesitate to make trouble. Years before, in the 1920s, she had a classroom assignment irrationally far from her office. So she arranged with the maintenance staff to put a desk outside that classroom, kind of blocking the corridor. And this was her protest her demonstration that um, she had not been treated well. Also, she never chaired the English department. People always assumed she did. In those days, it was largely a prestigious position. Um, I, I have no idea what degree of administrative work would have been involved back then. She was the first woman president of the Modern Language Association in 1958. And that was largely an honorary position. It still is. I mean, it isn't as if somebody has to run a large professional organization. There are staff people to do that. But Virginia Knoll told me about going with Louise Pound to Hovland Swanson <laughs> to buy a dress for the occasion. It was a brown silk, I think, dress. So she was always, in her way, very fashion conscious. Photographs show her with rather long red fingernails. She loved to play bridge. Robert Knoll talks about how competitive she was playing bridge and how she would say to Olivia, Cochran quotes this too, Olivia, breast your cards. <laughs> Evidently afraid that, you know, they were <coughs> capable of being observed. <laughs> mm. 
and she played on the boys' tennis team. Yes. Yes. So I find that most amazing. It's like the crew of the guys, and then she competed with them. Mm-hmm. And won. And won. Against men. Yeah, and that's saying a lot. Because I remember when Billie Jean King defeated, what's Bobby his name? Riggs. Tom, yeah, Bobby Riggs. Or was it Tommy or Bobby? Bobby? Bobby Riggs. And I remember not being a tennis player myself, hoping against hope, but what I was hearing without making any effort was, eh, woman can't possibly win. And I thought, but, 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 he doesn't look as if he's in shape. And she obviously was in great shape and had really prepared. That was the night that my family and I went to a big appliance store in Lincoln to buy, I think it was a a new washing machine. And when we walked in, everybody who worked there was huddled around a television set. (laughs) So that, that was a real milestone. 1974. Good. Thank you. Two years after Title IX. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, Babe uh, Dietrich and Zaharis was, you know, uh, overlapped with, but she was the only other woman that you ever hear about having that sort of status as an athlete. She what was golf her primary Anything game. She did Anything she did. Anything. She was also an Olympic athlete. So. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Well, I am very impressed with my women students at Doan who are athletes. Uh, Like the men, a lot of them walk around with crutches from time to time or Velcro braces, and it doesn't seem to stop them. And when I ask how they're doing, they speak very casually about a torn ACL. And I'm, I'm really in awe. Something that does baffle me, though, is that they do like to play rugby and that is super dangerous it's like football without protective gear and indeed um, two students that i have this semester and the men and women play together mm-hmm. and and that strikes me as very unwise simply because of the difference in in bulk but uh, a male student had uh, an operation because a year ago he was misdiagnosed and what he needed was an operation to repair a hamstring. So he was going around in an electric wheelchair and then a woman in another class, also playing rugby, has uh, an ACL problem. And uh, why this doesn't deter them from continuing to engage in athletic competition baffles me, but Louise Pound uh, is there as an example of someone who was not to be deterred. Though, um, I have not come across any reference to her getting injured. How, what size was she? She looks very petite in the picture. She was five feet five. That's from a, a passport, so actually. Tall for a woman then, at least yes. moderately. Yes. She doesn't look muscular. Oh, also, ice skating. She points out that there were no championships locally, that one had to skate on ponds in the winter. And we know that that's very uncertain because of the depth. And maybe the climate was different, but I remember from living back east that if you were going to skate on something outside, it had to be at a depth of five to six inches to make it safe. So, Any other thoughts or questions? Is it Cochrane culture an early feminist? Feminist pioneer. Feminist pioneer. So... Was there a national feminist movement that she would have been in touch with or involved with, or was she just focused on here in Lincoln, here at the university, doing what she could to promote women's causes there? Evidently the latter. She did a lot of speaking for the AAUW, the American Association of University Women. She traveled throughout Nebraska, and she also traveled beyond Nebraska. And her message 
was essentially that women should be educated as much as men should be educated. And um, she is credited with getting uh, families in uh, the less populous part of the state actually thinking along those lines because until they, they heard a Nebraska woman speak in those terms, it had seemed as if it were not necessary. Well, when was suffrage? When was universal suffrage? 1927, 1919? It was around in there, and that's a date that... So she would have been in her 40s then? Well, 1872, yeah. And how many women were in the English department when she was there? When she was there, that's a good See, question. She was very outnumbered by men, I would guess. Definitely. Definitely. Um, Cochrane goes on to mention some women who sometimes overlapped with Louise Pound, um, who were notable. Bernice Sloat, who gave us the, the, the wonderful description of early Lincoln as it may have been mud flats on the outside, but it was Boston within. <laughs> and Bernice Sloat, Cochrane cites this from Robert Noel, and I, I had not realized it. She didn't have a PhD. She said that she'd rather write her book on Keats, which she did. And uh, Bernice Sloat has, has an honored place in scholarship. She was one of the people who got uh, Willa Cather into published prominence, uh, working with Virginia Faulkner at the University of Nebraska Press. And uh, Cochrane speaks highly also of Virginia Faulkner, who came back to Nebraska with rather marvelous credentials. About five minutes. Five minutes, OK. Women in academe have not always had um, an easy time. Even now, in some areas, the problem is not so much the hiring, because there are programs in place of various um, enforcement strength to ensure that positions are advertised so that there's no longer an old boy network whereby academic positions are filled simply by somebody making a phone call to somebody who knows, who, who happens to have a student who's ready to cross the country from the Northeast to the Plains to take the job. So women can be hired, certainly if their credentials match or are better than those of the other people applying for the job. The problem often comes in promotion and getting into administrative positions, the departmental chairmanships, deanships. Some years ago, um, a woman in the political science department here at the University of Nebraska um, started a chapter of ASNIP, the American Council on Education's National Identification Program for Women. And the whole purpose of it was to get women who already had academic positions and maybe even a foothold on uh, administrative ladders into the pipelines to be considered for college and university presidencies. Now that has well, the program no longer exists. There are women presidents, a few of them, at the major places. But still, that's a difficult one for women to negotiate. And then, when a woman does achieve such a position, I think it's fair to say that often um, they're looked at more closely, their decisions are more harshly evaluated, and there, there isn't much slack. So they don't have comparative ease in the job. Terry Sullivan could probably speak to that. Mm. President of Virginia, who was really 
relieved of her responsibilities and then they were given back to her within a two week period <laughs> when it decided that in two years she hadn't turned around the institution. Oh. <laughs> well, that, that, that is a sterling example, which reminds me of how Louise Pound would sign her letters with the symbol for the British Pound Sterling. Thank you for that prompt. So she was not lacking in self-esteem. Well, I think we've run out of our time now. Yes, well, light just went off. Thank you so much. Well, I'm reminded of a line.